Franceschini and hello, Bob Heminger. This is Donna from the Hi. Editing Saxophone Podcast. How you doing, guys? Hi, Donna. How are you? We're doing good. Awesome. Uh, cool. doing fantastic. Thank you so much. Cool. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I got in touch with Russ Palladino, and he was telling me, I, I of course, knew mm -hmm. about the Inside Outside Retreat, but uh, he was telling me some really great information, and he said, you should really interview the Bobs. And then I realized there's- Yay three bobs running this retreat so that's like bob <laughs> that's right <laughs> so we got we have two of the bobs bob reynolds couldn't make it yeah. today but um that's right yeah he's caught up he's heading to europe on a tour and uh, doing some other stuff at the same time if you check his his uh he puts up some cool vlogs almost every week at least one for a while he was going every day for a while but so you can check his last vlog at any point in time and always find out what he's up to he's always he's he's doing so much stuff and he's a totally inspiring guy to check out absolutely you know? as are as are you both in fact i would love to find out a little bit more about your backgrounds and then i want to dive deep into the uh inside outside retreat so bob f let Sounds me start good. let me start with you tell us a little bit about like, okay. when you started playing the sax where you went to school your influences that <clears throat> All right. When I think about it, it scares me because it's so long ago. <laughs> but I started playing the saxophone in 1972. And uh, I started playing professionally when I got out of high school. I went to a special, a specialized high school called Music and Art High School. It was, uh, it's in New York City. It's moved from like, from the ghetto where it was originally up. In, and now it's in Link, it's at Lincoln Center. Uh, you know, so it's it's a lot nicer. My my son's there. My daughter will be going there next year. Wow. And uh, and I went to school with a bunch of great young musicians. And right out of high school, thinking about going to conservatory, I got offered some really good tours to the dismay of my parents. <laughs> they were like, my father was, was saying, you're going to break your mom's heart. And my, and my mom was saying, you're going to break your father's heart. <laughs> 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 but I figured, let me try this. And uh, it was a band. Uh, I had a summer gig with some some other guys that were in school with me who are now pretty famous. Uh, bassist Marcus Miller, drummer Omar Hakim, guitarist uh, Bobby Broom, and a, a keyboard player named Bernard Wright. And we had four nights a week at a club right near the school. Um, and it was a club that... that George Benson, the guitar player, singer, pop star guy, wow. he bought this little club. It was a little bar in Harlem. And, uh, and it wasn't too far from my house. So my parents let me do it. It was Thursday through Sunday, starting at 9 p.m. I think we used to play till about 3, 3 a.m. Wow. Four nights a week in the summer, getting paid really well. And beside that, we were just playing jazz standards and R&B standards and things like that. And uh, really, it was that that experience that really got my playing uh, up to par, like with, with guys that were working, you know. And so I got lucky right after that, that I started getting off for tours and I was uh, recording jingles and stuff like that at a young age, you know, wow. so. That was a so good. I did that, that for was a while. Good, that was a good time period. Um, you know. It, it was. Yeah, it's a lot different today. It was very different. There was a lot more going on for horn players uh, in the city. Like you could, when I wasn't on tour, I'd be working all week long. You know, there was there were sessions every day, several sessions every day, and you know, if you if you, I started out subbing for for. Uh, about three or four different guys and there was so much work that you literally you'd get a call and say can you be in the studio in 20 minutes you know cover for Lou Marini or Eddie Daniels or Michael Becker or uh, uh, who else was on the scene I can't uh, another saxophonist named George Young 
hey, can you cover for George? I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> you know, wow. Just like, I was living in the city and I was living on the Upper West Side and I would just cab it down to a studio maybe in Midtown somewhere and cover for them. Sometimes they would show up late and, uh, and but but mo a lot of times I got lucky and I got on a few things and then before you kn know it I was getting calls myself and uh, that lasted about a good ten I would say about ten years I had a ten, about a ten year run doing that mm. so it was it was an interesting experience there wasn't uh, I didn't feel the need to like become a uh, solo artist at that point in time you know I was just um, making a living and playing great music and the hang was awesome and playing a lot of local gigs and then touring with, with different, different artists, a lot of pop artists and Latin artists and people and th things like that. Wow. That, that sounds amazing. And I could just think of all like the, uh, just the learning and the mentorship, you know, how that shaped mm -hmm. you as a player. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting time. There was a lot of uh, guys that had done like, the rock bands like Blood, Sweat, and Tears in Chicago, and um, a band called Dreams, the Brecker Brothers were in, and, and there were a few horn bands that had, but especially Blood, Sweat, and Tears, like Lou Marini and Lou Soloff, and 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 uh, and bands like that. That that those players were getting, they were like the number one call at that point. They weren't, they didn't really want to go out and do a lot of touring, so they were home a lot. But. Uh, they were super cool with the younger musicians. Amazing. Real, like you said, like mentors that would just, and they were all, they were all great players. So a lot of the, a lot of the discussions were about jazz, about improvisation and check out this record. And, you know, why don't you go study with so-and-so? And so it was amazing. It was a really an amazing time. Wow, so that, that, I think the closest you can do now is by going to some conservatory, you know, and, and there's some places now where a lot of players teach at, you know, and can mentor you and things like that. So it's, it's, it's gone from being on the street to, I think, I think now that that scene is happening more on a conservatory level, you know. That's a great observation. Let, let me ask uh, Bob H., Bob Heminger. So tell, tell me about your background, because I'm sure it's, it's a lot different. <laughs> it is very different. Actually, although there's a couple commonalities here. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I started playing saxophone in, th in fifth grade, beginning band, and I uh, just played through school, had some fun in high school with uh, a, a side band and um, went on to college. And my my two real passions and, and loves are um, music and uh, nature. I was always very drawn and fascinated by uh, how indigenous people lived with the land, and I wanted to know everything about the wildlife, the animals, the plants. And, um, so I was kind of torn when I went to college as to which direction to go, uh, since both those were pretty even. Um, and when I got to, uh, I went to Central Michigan University, um, I got into the top jazz band there and played, but I, I was a biology major. And, uh, I focused in on that aspect, but I always played and, you know, played all the frat parties and the, was in a kind of a society band and, and doing different things. And of course, back then you could, you, you could, you know, pay for college just by gigging a bunch. Right. Don't do that anymore. But, um, so, uh, I did that and I really followed that path of, um, the nature thing. So I ended up doing graduate school. Uh, in animal behavior. Uh, I spent wow. a couple summers out in the Adirondacks uh, studying a bird called the loon, which um, we were looking at how acid rain was changing their behaviors. And all mm -hmm. this time, I, I was always playing music, um, but I never really studied it. But it, it, it's always kind of been a natural thing. And, um, and then I got asked to uh, uh, work uh, with a guy by the name of Tom Brown Jr., uh, who runs the tracker school. Um, and uh, he asked me if I would come and, and be an instructor at his school. And so I kind of needed a break. I was teaching zoology and doing a bunch of stuff in grad school. And I thought I need a little break from all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so that's when I dove really into the primitive skills and learning about uh, you know, how do you take care of yourself with just what you 
have your hands and, uh, and also studied um, tracking and, and a lot of the wildlife work that I had done kind of came into play uh, with that and I, that got real passionate um, funny little side story I actually in 1983 uh, opened for Shaka Khan oh wow uh, oh wow in Michigan and I'm standing on the side of the stage and I'm watching this this New York kid with his hat kind of tilted sideways playing the saxophone with Shaka Khan and I'm watching this guy going wow man this guy's real good I wonder if I could ever do that I, I, maybe I could do that mm. come to find out it was Bob Francis ah. <laughs> yeah that's right that's <laughs> and now right. we've great friends yeah i forgot there. about that story i forgot about that that's right <laughs> so oh i was God. literally sitting there watching him on the side of the stage going man that, that kid can play man that's just good this is good Goodness and now gracious. we're running a retreat together and been good friends yeah. for a long time so I'm 35 excited. years later ah, i love those little crossovers when that kind of it's stuff. awesome yes so it's, i continue really playing awesome. and music has always been one of those things for me that um uh, and now as I get older, I, I, it's probably even taken over the passion with the outdoors. And, uh, and you're working. I mean, you're doing, you're gigging. I, I gig a bunch and I tour uh, some, not any big tours. I do a lot of festivals. You know, I, I live in a little town out uh, in southwest Colorado. And um, so I'm in on a lot of the, the Telluride festivals and uh I work with some singer songwriters. And I, I've had some remarkable experiences for a guy who, who wasn't focused on it, uh, amazing things, everything from, you know, sitting in with a Zach Brown band in front of 17,000 people. I don't even know how that happened, uh, let alone, uh, you know, all these other gigs that I've been able to do at big festivals and stuff. So uh, yeah. music, my path is a little different. Uh, and, you know, the piece that I bring to these, to the Inside Outside Retreat is uh, working with musicians and helping them reconnect uh, with with nature and just slow them down. That's totally That's awesome. That I bring in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, that, and I was just going to quickly say that Bob Reynolds comes from another approach. Yeah. He had gone to Berkeley and and he did that, you know, so he's coming from from that end of it. He's younger than us and right. he's, you know, he connected with a bunch of great musicians that started touring and doing things when he got out of Berkeley, but he he's, he took that approach of, you know, the, the more, the more contemporary approach where, where your mentors are actually at school, you know, yeah. and it's different. It's not, I, you know, it's, so we have this unique kind of tr triad going with the three Bob. of us coming from three different places. <laughs> three Bobs, three different places, three different experiences. Yeah. <laughs> That's the new t-shirt yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually that, thanks for thanks for bringing up um, Bob Reynolds' background too, because that's that's important for I think people to know. Um, you know mm -hmm. how the three of you contribute, and I'm gonna you know safely assume that you know the people that attend the retreat are gonna get that vast knowledge and the three different perspectives. I think that makes it. Mm -hmm. very unique. It's interesting. It's interesting. Um, I think I think that we get a vastly different types of people coming as well if we get we get people from all over the world um all ages from 17 and 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 older um and some guys are professionals some guys are out there gigging and working and they and and they just want a week of immersion and just doing trying to get some new stuff together or get get on track with um you know uh, some fresh ideas for for improvising or for practicing or, or and then but but also there's this you know saxophone players we want to talk about reeds and mouthpieces and you know so so people can't do that with their spouses you know the spouses go crazy if i hear anything else about an old link i'm gonna go crazy you know that kind of <laughs> so so it's a chance to do some of that you know mingling and and then um and and bonding. I mean, I think the nature aspect of it really is is the glue. You yeah. know, I think I think you'd agree, right, Heminger? With that, I mean. Yes, and just that, the 
just the idea of, of giving yourself that gift of going away for a week, you know, the week yeah. starts on Tuesday and ends on Sunday and, and, you know, being surrounded by other like-minded people. I mean, there's, there's, uh, it's very inspiring. There's a community aspect that happens immediately. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, I really, there's, there's a pretty cool thing that happens and people stay in touch. And, you know, I know Francis Kinney, you turn around, you run into past retreaters all almost the time. every night, almost every night, yeah. somebody from camp shows up at one of the shows. Wow. That's, that's yeah. awesome. if not more, sometimes a couple, a couple, two, three guys show up all of a sudden. No, it's a neat know. community. We've got amazing food that happens and, uh, the mm. Wooten Woods is just a beautiful place to, uh, to be it's kind of a magical uh, little hideaway there in Tennessee and um, it's just wonderful um, uh, it really it, something some magical happens in that week and and uh, I do think by giving yourself that gift of slowing down and and really diving in and getting away from the cell phones and getting away from the, the rat race that our lives can be and and focusing in on how can I be a better musician and a better person and how can I uh, connect a little bit and slow down. Um, uh, we've just seen remarkable things happen, and, and it's it's right. beautiful. Yeah. Now yeah. let me let me ask you about um, two things actually, because I do want to tie into the nature thing, and I wanted to ask mm-hmm. you how did the idea first of all the name Inside Outside Retreat? Because a lot of people would think jazz playing inside outside the changes, but I have a feeling mm-hmm. it's not exactly that. But how did the, mm-hmm. idea for the retreat come along? Who was the one that sparked it? You know, how did you, how did the three of you come to, you know, come together and, and form it? Mm. You want me to tell them? Yeah, so, go um, ahead. Okay, well, from my view, I think Bob Heminger, I think I approached Bob about doing camp. Like, we were, we, we work with Victor Wooten at his camps. Right. And we both saxophone players, so we hang out quite a bit. And some, and we just started talking about possibly doing a saxophone camp. And shortly after that, I mean, within days, I saw a YouTube video of of uh, Bob Reynolds. Let me think if it was that. Yeah, it must have been a video. And he was saying he was thinking about doing some kind of a retreat or something, but he was looking for a place to do it in, and he. I saw him at this at this place that just looked like the wrong kind of place to do us do something like that and and <laughs> and so I approached him and said, you know, uh, Bob Heminger and I, you know, have this idea for for camp at Victor Woods and and it just all just we just kept you know uh, having conversations about it and brainstorming about it and then, and it, and we made it happen, you know, and uh, it's been great. Every every year it gets a we we get a little better every year Absolutely. and the turnout gets a little better every year and and what we can offer gets better every year i think you know as as we learn uh how to how to handle it's it's a lot of people to handle for you know 60 saxophone players at first it was it was overwhelming at first we were like what the heck are we going to do with 60 saxophone players you know we did not expect that kind of a turnout first of all we thought we would be lucky if maybe 20 something people showed up, but wow. yeah. um, we learned and it works. It works. We, we, we break it up into smaller groups and we've got, we're lucky to have four or five different places that we can teach at, at the, on the camp and the campsite, different uh, buildings that we have. And it works. We bring in guest artists, guest teachers. Uh, every day there's a different guest artist. So we split it up into groups four or five groups and everybody gets a chance to visit with all the teachers. So what we call rotations. So every, every hour and a half or so, uh, one group will go on to the next teacher. So the teachers all stay, they, we stay in one place all day. We, each of us is, takes a room oh, and the, the students come and visit us every hour and a half or so. Okay. And then those rotations are broken up with what we call specials, which is like special guest performances or lectures, um, and um, and so that that ha- that goes on all day all day long till till dinner time. And after dinner, usually sometimes before dinner, there's a little there's a little chance to just 
take a break and just relax. Some guys immediately start practicing. So if you walk around the camp, you see people walking around with saxophones playing it into trees, you know, that kind of thing. It looks kind of like a, like a, the walking dead kind of vibe. You know, if you just, if you just drove up and saw these guys and you had your ears and you weren't listening, you'd say, what the heck is this? You know, <laughs> That could be but your we promo have dinner shot. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. We have some cool video. Uh, Bob Reynolds, we, we, it was supposed to be nice video, but Bob Reynolds put some scary horror music to it and made this really cool uh, video. We haven't, we haven't released that one yet. We haven't seen that yet. We didn't when, you, when you put the music to it, man, it's like, it looks pretty scary. <laughs> but, uh, That's awesome. Then, and then after dinner, after, after this amazing meal you know eat actually each meal is pretty amazing we have a chef his name is john shop award-winning chef um and i mean i mean amazing every every meal is, is unbelievable um and so after dinner we usually have a performance a slash lecture so and you know we had uh last year chris potter joined us for for one of those um We've had uh, Kirk Willem, Joshua Redman actually came back. He, he asked to come back the next year. Cool. And basically for the key lime pie that, <laughs> that Chef John makes. So, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But <laughs> he did fall in love with it. And, uh, and who else has come? Well, we've had uh, Jeff Coffin, Steve Wilson. Oh, yeah. uh, Ooh, we have yeah. Pedro Saxo one year. Pedro Saxo. Uh, man, you yes. remember that? And uh, we had Aaron was Goldberg. Awesome. We brought in uh, this, that great uh, uh, pianist who uh, was really fun to work with. So we, mm -hmm. we try and bring in uh, a variety of people and, um, and give some inspiration. We've had, of course, Victor Wooten uh, as a guest right. instructor. And, and in building this camp, when you asked about how this whole thing came about, and Francis Gini mentioned this, you know, we the two of us have worked uh, for a long time with Victor Wooten at his Center for Music and Nature, mm -hmm. and um, and we did model this after what we learned from him in the camp there, right. mm -hmm. and uh, it's been right. just wonderful to be able to turn that in towards saxophone players and the uniqueness. Mm -hmm. We also bring in a, a a tech, somebody that can work on horns and give advice and. Give oh, a wow. talk on uh, you know what happens kind of green room you know emergency something happens before you go on stage how what's right. the first aid what can you do to fix it right and right. it's uh, really helpful bring, yeah. yeah we bring in lots of different uh, things just trying to make it as complete as possible and um, and all that good stuff so it really we we owe a lot to Victor Root and I, I would have to say yes. That. Absolutely, camp. he's, he's so really inspiring. Great. So inspiring yeah. guy. He's very inspiring. Uh, Francis Keeney's out touring with him and Dennis Chambers, yeah. and actually now it's the Wooten brothers and Sinbad. The comedian. terrific comedian Sinbad. Yeah, that's the last tour we just came that. back on. It was pretty, pretty incredibly fun. Yeah, Sinbad. Sinbad fun. was one of my students for a while. He's he's a funny guy. He's a nice. Oh, guy. kid. Oh, all right. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah, oh yeah. my God! Yeah, he found me on YouTube. He's awesome, man. He's crazy. <laughs> He's, He's crazy. hilarious. And uh, uh, he on this tour, he was playing trombone. Yeah, yep, yep. I was teaching him trumpet and saxophone. Yeah, I know. He he he, he takes up a different instrument each week. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. He was awesome, man. Um, oh, I also wanted to mention that that we have uh, rhythm sections that we bring down as yeah. well. So the guys get to play a whole lot. Uh, we've brought down some like super, super, duper badass uh, rhythm section players who often, sometimes they'll do a clinic and talk about what they, how they do what they do. It's very informative to saxophone players. We, you know, we often don't know the details of it and how they back us up, what they listen for. Why they who why they would hire a saxophone player? Or, you know what they look for in a saxophone player, and 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 it's it's an interesting thing. It's very very uh, very informative. It's things that we don't usually we don't usually have the opportunity to sit around and talk to rhythm section this way. 
No, that, that and, definitely uh, is, uh, is super important and it's different. And from what you're saying too, like you mentioned the age range is like, it's adults, it's 17 plus, 17 years old or plus. Right. And it sounds to me, the skill level cannot be beginner. Uh, sorry folks, but it, it no. sounds like it's gotta be intermediate or higher. Correct. Right. I would say, I would say like, you mm -hmm. have to be able to get a decent sound, be able to play relatively in tune uh know some scales no like if we're talking about keys i mean it helps if you if you're if you have some um jazz background in terms of improvising you know an improvisation background but we do we do we have had musicians that that were we had to really start at ground zero in terms of in terms of the improvisation side of it and and it's been great like especially classical there were classical oh, saxophone players who yeah. wanted to learn how to improvise yeah. so they had facility but they had they didn't have a, a a notion about how to put together the theory with the saxophone and and become you know more improvisers you know right. and and so that's been interesting we've had uh players who don't have a lot of chops but our creative people and and we make it all we make it all work i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't i don't think it would be a good idea for a beginner beginner to come it'd be out of they'd be out of their out of their element there yeah but uh you know there's some people who who who, who like played saxophone uh in in high school or something and stopped and and just have a passion for it and come back and you know, I, I'm thinking about a couple of guys in particular who who rediscovered that they could play. Right. So that uh, the first few days they were like sounded really raw, you know, and by the end of the camp at the final performance it was amazing. Just yeah. being around that much saxophone energy, I think you know, it it, it gets into very your blood. supportive very <clears throat> supportive environment. One of the things that uh, mm -hmm. you know, this will be our fourth year and there is not um the egos are not an issue, which is wonderful. Yeah. We've joked about whether or not if we, this was a 60 lead guitarist, if we'd have issues or not. <laughs> Nothing against guitarists. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I was going to joke. But we, uh, it's really super supportive. And, and everybody that's there, whether you're, you know, you're 55 and you just picked up the horn again and you used to play and gig in college, but you don't do it that anymore, but you really want to bring music back in your life. We have a lot of those folks and kind of weekend warriors yeah. that, you know, jam and play gigs on the weekend at the local bars or whatever. And it's just a, a super supportive environment where you mm. can take some risks and just let it go. And by the end of the week, um, you're flying high. So, yeah. 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 Let me ask you about that. Too. Let, let, yes. let's, oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, let's say that there's no, no, somebody who's, uh, <laughs> who's, you know, maybe coming back into playing or, or someone who's nervous about playing in front of other people. Um, do they mm -hmm. need to prepare anything before they play? Like that nervous person, how can you reassure them? Is there anything you would want them to have prepared before they play? You know, that kind of thing, auditions, anything like that? Uh, we take care of that the first night and get that out of mm -hmm. the way. Okay. <laughs> We're not going to say any more than that. Okay. Yeah, uh, we have a we have really a method that that really works to get people to really just relax and open up and and feel feel supported. You know, they feel supported, and so you know, they before they know it, they're 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 up and they're playing. That's yeah. awesome. You know? That's awesome. That's yeah, pretty awesome. Yeah, because the, the first night is awesome. Because a lot of folks, you know, have do have that fear, especially if they haven't been playing yeah. for a while, and it's like, oh my God, people are going to judge me. But you know, just having right. that that tool, that mechanism, to calm people down. And and the other thing too, I wanted to get into, um, how does I? I'm glad you ran through like a typical day. Do you? I'm going to make an assumption. Are you incorporating elements of the nature aspect throughout the day, or is it certain activities that happened, you know, at various times? Uh, good question. Uh, we do a, a couple group activities that are designed to really uh, get people to um, kind of, you know, we we tune our instruments. And so these these activities are designed to tune you uh, and they just kind of get in tune and slow down. Um, 
And uh, but there each day of classes, uh, like Bob was saying, there's there's about four different rotations. So each group transfers, you know, throughout the day. Uh, so you hit all four of the classes. Um, and one of those each day is a nature rotation, and that that's the piece that I teach. Okay. Um, and right. we tie in some things, you know. Our, uh, I'm imagining your listeners are like all of us. It life gets just so crazy busy, and there's so many distractions and phones and booking new gigs, and it just it's a rat race. And we're really not designed uh, as human beings to deal with that amount of stress. And that constant, just that constant thing. Um, and so, a lot of the rotations that I'm doing are really designed to to slow you down, um, get to that place where you're you're feeling a little more aware of what's around you, um, both from a nature standpoint. But as you expand that uh, awareness and an understanding. Um, you really start to uh, you can take all of these things and take them right to the bandstand. I mean, it's all the exact mm-hmm. same stuff. I, I believe, you know, a, a basketball player would call it the zone, and and us musicians, mm-hmm. when we get in that place where the music's just playing us, we're not thinking about it. That magical place that we all strive to get to. Uh, that's the same thing when you really immerse yourself in nature and you and you start to feel a connectedness and and an understanding, and so. Most of the classes that I do around that are designed to kind of open your eyes up to grow a little more awareness of your surroundings and, and feel. Um, we do some activities where we take away your vision so that you your other senses expand. Cool. Um, and uh, it's all safe. Well, we promise we don't like send people out naked and afraid into the woods and <laughs> pick them up on Sunday covered in ticks or something. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. We're, uh, it's very supportive, and it's all challenged by choice. If there's something you say, wait, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that. Um, okay. uh, I remember asking Sinbad if he would take his shoes off so he could go barefoot for this one activity. He's like, oh, I'm not taking my shoes off. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> yeah. all right. You don't have to. Me neither. I'm not into taking uh-huh. my shoes off, man. But I know it's more. I know that now. You know, years later, I'm I'm tempted, man. I'm like, well, yeah, we'll get we'll get it. you New York boy and the I LA mob and you out there running around barefoot before you know it. But I see how people are moved, you know. They really are moved after the experience. You know, they just you know. It's different. It's different. It's something different. So it's a I think it's a good thing to experience, you know. Yeah, and, and it's at least it's not uh, sounding like saxophone survivor. <laughs> you know that scene. Uh, right, right. It's yeah. not. Uh, we're not going to give you a <laughs> no, no, roll of that heavy. tape. And you you got to go make your own saxophone in the woods out of pine. <laughs> <laughs> right, no, right. it's not that sort of thing. It it really is designed to sort of deepen you, to slow you down, and to really, um, you know, when we us adults we get in ruts and we don't try new things, we don't do different things, and. If you're you know, a listener right now who's somebody who just, you know, you want a new experience that just opens things up, um, this is one aspect. Uh, and then we tie the whole thing in. You know, we've all been on the bandstand before where we just, we we know what that feels like when you're just all connected and things are moving. And um, right. I do believe that a great musician doesn't play music. Uh, music plays them. Mm-hmm. And so how do you get to that place where where it's playing you? Um, and that's we, the goal. that's my yeah. years with Victor Wooten, uh, right. and prior to that, I actually had met Victor Wooten. I was an instructor out at the tracker school and, um, Victor came out and took a camp. This was in 1991. That's how we connected. And the whole time we were teaching him wilderness survival skills, he was seeing it as music. Everything was music. And that's where this whole concept was birthed right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the, in, the retreat or the inside out, outside you know, uh, title. Uh, how we came up with that title? Yeah. Yeah. Well, should we tell them what we were thinking about calling it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you you were saying. I mean, Victor came up with the idea of the connection with music and nature. Okay. Yeah. So it was his, really... his. It was his passion that 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 he he bought this 150 acre wooded area to do camps in because he wanted to to. to have a place where people could come and see the connection between music and nature. 
Right. So, so yeah. Victor's camps are, are, uh, you know, the inspiration for us. And, and well, the name inside outside, I think is multi-leveled, you know, we're, we were thinking about inside and then there's, we play outside too, live physically outside and we're out in nature and it's, uh, about inside playing and we did get into outside playing and I, I mean it's any way that you could take the words that's what it, it, it does you know it's 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 dealing with the inside the mind and the soul and that kind of thing and then the outside the technique and that kind of thing yeah and merging yeah. the two so, yeah merging the two yeah you know, yeah get, get tune, not tuning up but getting in touch with your inside you know your uh your calmness your oneness and then bringing that yeah. out yeah when you play yeah so, and right. I, I think that's that. a big part of it we had originally uh kicked around the idea since we're out at wooten woods we we thought about calling it sax in the woods but we thought yeah. we'd get some pretty bad uh traffic on the internet if we <laughs> called it <laughs> no one little letter we didn't call it sax yeah, in right, the woods right right. <laughs> right right but that is that i is, do that still is own the, the domain obvious. by the way it's the most obvious title, though. It would be Sacks in the Woods. Would be, uh, would be <laughs> and if he's, obvious. On, if he's on the beach, it would be Sacks on the beach. But then, you know, we'd exactly. Exactly. You know, we talked go. about that. We were talking about Sacks yeah. on a cruise ship. We were thinking how we could expand this. Sacks in a raft. I want to do a raft right. trip. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, but man. we thought we'd better go with Inside Outside. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's awesome. Yeah. It's definitely awesome. And so... Let me ask you a little bit also, what are the facilities like? I mean, you're, you're, are, they, are people um, staying in cabins or how does that work? Great. Uh, you there's, know there, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take this one because I would run. Oh, you were there too. It's just still fresh in my mind. We, Bob and I both did a, a, a uh, camp for Victor and there were 70 students. And so I remember, you know, pretty much where everybody was so that we do have cabins um they're air conditioned and uh we use military style cots there's tons of, of uh, sleeping bags and people bring people who drive in especially bring tents as well mm-hmm. some people not a lot of people stay in tents but we do have some and i think i think they get the most out of it when they when they do the whole tent thing some people pull up in like trailer with like a with a uh, rvs or whatever those are those i don't know the name of them where they have their own little little thing yeah the rvs yeah yeah the little the little ones and then uh yeah so but but basically we have the we have the cabins um and we uh we provide some stuff people 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 do bring it's on the it's on the it's on the it's all on the uh, website the information is on the website yeah but, so there we, there we can accommodate option. a lot of people we can accommodate a lot of people it's not overcrowded there's bathhouses there's a big bathhouse and uh um lots of facilities toilets and and things and you know so yeah, you know yeah it's you know. full service and it, there is it's full um, service. We there is an option as well, uh, especially if people have their own transportation to stay off site. Oh, okay. uh, we were asking that you're on site just for the full experience. Um, but yeah, there are hotels idea, nearby. Yeah, if your idea of you know if, if sleeping in a group cabin with a bunch of other people isn't really your thing, then bring a tent um, or uh, you can stay. There's a bed and breakfast not far, and yeah, there's uh, a few hotels down the road. Uh, we yeah, don't. We have people uh, stay there. Yeah. What's that? No, I said we've had people stay at the bed and breakfast, and they love it. And, oh yeah, absolutely. They drive in in the morning. Yeah. Let me ask you, um, what's the ratio of men to women? Well, we're working on that ratio. Okay. Uh, it is uh, probably I would say maybe one one out of ten is female. Okay. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little more than that. Um, last year, I think we had, I want to say, seven or eight. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, uh, we would love to have, have more. We would love to have more balance ratio. Yeah. Their own cabin as well, and uh, all of that. Right. So, uh, 
that's good. I was going to ask about that too. Yeah, because that that would yeah. definitely be important uh, with that. So let me ask you then: Are there uh, you know you talked about like a typical day and stuff like that? Um, when do people have the opportunity to jam with that rhythm section? Is it throughout those sessions during the day, or does it happen at night? Or well, this this year, the idea we're going to bring in we're going to have two rhythm sections full time, mm. and so during the rotations, there's there are classes where they get to play with the rhythm section. There's, there's a classroom where they play with, with they, we use play along tracks because we try to get to some specific things and we don't want to burden the rhythm section with like playing the same two measures over and over again or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, and at, and uh, at night we have two, we will have uh, two rhythm sections set up one more like traditional straight ahead, bebop, hard bop, you know, thing. And then in, in another place, we have a rhythm section that will be more groove oriented, uh, vamp oriented kind of thing, you know, for players who, who want to, want to do that. And you can go between them. I mean, you know, they jam all night. They start the jam start usually after the last performance or, or lecture, maybe about eight thirty, and they go till about 1130 midnight and, and people, they cross pollinate, you know. <laughs> they make the rounds. I think we're going to also have a play along tent at night too for people who, with with maybe one of the instructors, kind of hanging out and they can ask questions and we can work on details and whatever they want to work on. Wow, that, that and, sounds uh, awesome. That that, that was. And we stay we stay on site. You know, the the, the instructors we stay on site uh, as well, and so you know, up until one a.m we're usually we're usually avail totally available to to talk and you know have private one-on-one -on -one discussions with people you know awesome. so we hang out and sometimes we sit in on the jams and, and you know so we're around so you, there's plenty of opportunity to like get a one-on-one -on -one discussion with with one of the instructors that was going to be my next question, Even, actually. So I'm glad yeah. that, that you answered that because I think, um, you know, as people getting to know you through the, through this podcast and through other ways too, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think it'll be really, really great for people to realize that the benefit that they have with that. So tell, uh, if you could tell us, first of all, what are the dates for this year? This is 2018. Right. That's July 17th through the 22nd. It's a Tuesday uh, through a Sunday. Um, we, if people are flying into Nashville Airport, uh, we have two shuttles that run on um, that Tuesday, one at noon and one at three. So we try and get everybody there. Um, mm -hmm. we, last year of the 60 people, we had uh, 11 different countries represented. And so some of those people that had traveled from overseas came in the night before and just got a hotel room in Nashville. Uh, and mm -hmm. then meet us for the shuttle. So we'll get everybody. The facility, Wooten Woods, is about an hour outside of Nashville. And mm -hmm. so we have two shuttles that run on that Tuesday, or you can just drive right to the camp. We'll give you directions and unload and park your car for the week. Um, and then on Sunday, when we wrap things up uh, around one or so, um, we have the shuttles heading back to the airport. Um, right. On that Tuesday, um, uh, we try and get people there anywhere from noon to five so that uh, you can get your bunk and get all set uh, and registered. And then we kick things off with a big meal, usually by 5.30 or 6. Uh, we get started on a Tuesday night. And then it's it's full on until Sunday at about noon. Cool. Yeah. And, and what, um, you know, I was just, just thinking about something too, because I've written a bunch of, I did some research, I've written a bunch of articles about, you know, traveling with your horn on a plane and stuff like that. Um, mm. I don't know if you have this opportunity available uh, or whatever, but, you know, sometimes for some people, it's really hard to travel, you know, with their horn and, you know, you have to have a special case or whatever. You really don't want to have it checked, you know, unless it's... Uh, Never. Case. Yeah, don't check the horn. Yeah. So have you ever had an instance where someone like couldn't bring their horn or it was badly damaged, you know, where you had extra horns for people to use, or that's probably too much to, uh, to deal with. Cause you're, you know, an hour out of Nashville and stuff. Well, we have, we have, a, like Bob was saying, we have a technician on hand. Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of incidences where people came in and, and, and their horns were, were damaged, yeah. nothing major, but there were some, some, 
you know, there were a couple of, of things for traveling. If you're not experienced and they, and they, and they tell you, no, you can't bring that on the plane. If you're not experienced, you'll, you'll just agree. But, but I, well, I've been doing this for 40 plus years and, and you just have to insist. You just have to be calm and calmly say, it's not possible to check this in. Let's find a solution, you know, in a closet, under a seat, whatever. There's, you know, and the thing is, they, they, there's always room on a plane for a saxophone. I've never found a plane that the saxophone didn't fit in the overhead. So there's always a way. Because if the worst comes to worst, you take the instrument out of the case and you pull, pull up, pull your jacket down or whatever, and you put your instrument on top of that and you find some pillows or whatever, and you put it over the instrument and you check just the case in, you gate check just the case. If that worst, absolute worst thing happens. Don't ever, ever check your saxophone under the plane. Even if they say, no, we'll walk it down, it'll be fine, you know, don't do it. I've, I, I did it twice in my life and both times my horns were, were damaged. Mm. You know, I mean, literally watch the guy take the thing down to the plane and put it in, get it back, watch them come back with it, and the saxophone's damaged. It's amazing. So I don't know, you know, how they managed to do it, but it's, it's something I wouldn't do. But most of the time, just what works is just being calm and cool and just saying, let's find a solution. I really, really can't do this. And And a lot of times... Another thing that people don't try is if you if you're carrying your saxophone and you're carrying another bag, that usually is what sets off an alarm. So bring a bag that you can check in if you have, not a saxophone bag. I'm saying for your for your other stuff, make sure that that's something that you can give at the gate and say, okay, well check this bag in. And if you have to pull your computer out and carry your computer on with your horn, that's what you do. But have an option of saying, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with you. I'm going to compromise you. I'm going to, yeah, I will check a bag and I'll check out this rolling bag. In. And this, that usually doesn't, you know. Yeah, this, so. it's, it's, yeah, it's such a, it, it really is such an issue. And, um, you know, uh, when I did the research too, I mean, you know, I've heard horror stories, not just with saxophones, but all types of instruments. And I was just thinking, you've yeah. got people coming from all over the world and, you know, it's it's important for them to realize that, yeah, you, you can bring your horn, you just have to, there's certain ways to do it, you know, so I'm glad right. that you yeah. expanded upon that, especially with your extensive experience of touring, um, you know, yeah. we'll need to well, know. My, my experience is that on international flights, there's never a problem. Oh, okay. On an international flight, it's extremely rare that you won't, uh, they won't allow a, a saxophone on. They seem to be more uh, they have more heart for musicians in other countries than in our in our own country. They see a saxophone and they say, oh, saxophone, okay, you know, no problem. And in the States, you know, if it's, a, if it's not a, a violin, so sometimes I'll say I'm carrying a, a viola or a cello. I'll say, well, what do you have? I'll say, it's a cello. It's like a, you know, nine, $900,000 cello. I can't check it in, you know. <laughs> And they're fine. Oh, oh, it's a, oh, a cello. Oh, yeah. Walk this way. You know, Pilo, come out, shake your hand. You know, some. But it's a saxophone. No, nah, that can go under the plane. Don't worry about it. It's metal. You know. So, <laughs> so, anyway. Uh, but go. but that's one good thing. International flights usually is no worries because usually bigger plane. You know, plenty of overhead space and that kind of thing. It's usually on the on the commuter type flights where where you're gonna run into some hassles. Right. So folks, you know. for those of you that are interested and, you know, you do have to fly in, just keep these, these points in mind. It's, this is not, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, what do you call it? Your, your way of going in flying, it shouldn't disqualify you from taking advantage of this camp. So, you know, just keep that in mind, mm -hmm. folks. And actually what I wanted to get into also, we've got the dates, the location, uh, what's the cost and is there a deposit? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, the cost, uh, first of all, in order to save um, your your place, you need to do a four hundred dollar non refundable uh, deposit. And that, when you go to our website, insideoutsideretreat.com, you can click on that and go to the registration page. Um, it's all the way to the right hand corner in a box. It says register. 
click on that and that'll take you into um, uh, how to go about the registration process itself. We're going to have you fill out a form um, with all your pertinent information and then you go right to a PayPal account on step two and you pay that $400 deposit. Um, and that then saves your position. We do have once in a while people just fill out the form and not pay the the deposit and that, that doesn't save your spot. So, um, and then you'll pay the balance of 795 and that balance will be due uh, a day before the retreat starts. So we try and get everything done there. There's also information there. In fact, if somebody wants to click on some of these forms that are on there just to read up and learn about some of the other details as far as travel and, and lodging and things, um, you're welcome to just click up on our follow up information there. We have you fill out a medical, a dietary, and a travel form as well, just so we know what's happening. And when we can take care of all your dietary needs, um, the chefs are amazing and are able to, it, it doesn't matter uh, what it is, uh, even if you're a breathitarian and all you do is breathe, uh, we can take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the air is great. <laughs> the air is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's amazing. But... Uh, I, was, I, I just wanted to add, you know, um, what was the balance? I don't remember what the balance was. So the balance, uh, we had an early bird special. The balance now that's is That's right. That's what I want. Five. Uh, so yeah. the total cost is eleven ninety five, and that includes uh, all your meals, lodging, and all the instruction, and a shuttle back and forth if you need it. Um, and uh, we feel like that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, for all that meals and lodging and, and, you know, really, really good meals. And, and I, yeah, I was going to ask about the meals. There's a lot of people that have food allergies or, you know, right. uh, celiac or that kind of thing. So that's really... They'll take care of everything. Yeah, that's a big part of the catering is that they, they tailor everything for everybody's needs. You know, that's so that's, that's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and they take care of it with a smile on their face and uh, yep. they're dancing to music and having a good old time in the kitchen. So... The chefs are awesome. They're just yeah. awesome people. And they keep everybody, you know, before the meals, they come out and, and talk and, and, and put on a little show before every meal. <laughs> just, you know, it's Am it up. incredible. It's really unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's, that sounds awesome. And, and, you know, it's so interesting because the way you're talking about it, it just sounds like a whole communal experience. You know, the meal is an important part. It's an important part of the day, and people nowadays, uh, gosh, I remember when I was growing up, I mean, you know, both my parents worked, my father worked the night shift, my mother worked a lot, but my grandparents uh, lived with me. I'm, I'm half Italian, so my Italian grandparents lived with me, and you know, Italians, we eat at like three o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> so I'd, I'd get home from school, and grandma would have the pasta ready, you know, and I'd be eating with my uh, grandparents and stuff, and God, I miss those days, but um, you know, you don't really have that anymore and i think that's a really um that's a really good part good piece you know to have that's because right. i think people need that sense of uh community and, and connection what i've noticed at camp is that just when you like when the bell rings we have a bell that we ring between between classes but it just seems like we're always eating doesn't it seem like that to you <laughs> she's like you know what non-stop meal we eat so much and uh, this huge gigantic breakfast more than i'd eat all day normally and right. by the time the lunch bell rings i mean the food is so good that you can't help but like fill your plate up and just yeah you say like i'm not, you know what today i'm not going to eat lunch yeah i'm gonna skip yeah. lunch and you can and then you walk into the into where the catering is and you're just like i'll just try it <laughs> so, so. no losing weight it's at this camp. Whole <laughs> the whole experience is is designed for that uh just coming together and and yeah. diving deep into music and nature and and uh and building kind of a tribal thing where everybody's feeling good we end uh saturday night we end with big concert we have a rhythm section in and each uh group performs um some right. intricate arranged jams and solos and we do group stuff and trios and we we just it's yep. a huge celebration the last night uh and goes on for hours and hours of everybody just having a good old time uh, yeah yeah playing music and demonstrating things that they've learned we ask them to you know bring in something that you learned this week uh, to mm -hmm. solo 
and tie it in. Mm-hmm. And it's a big celebration. It's, it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Tell me something. They always um, blow us away. They blow us away. It's amazing, Donna. You, would, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> by, by, by the end of, but yeah, I, I, this last night, you just can't believe it. It's like, how did they it get it so together cool. like that? Incredible. That actually must be so amazing, amazing for you to see as instructors. People it, walk in a certain way, and then all of a sudden, a week later, it's yeah. like, wow. Yeah, like you said, you get, we get people who are literally have terrible stage fright, and by the end of the week, they're the one that's in front of the group, you know, jumping across the stage and landing on their knees, and you know, it's like, it's like it's crazy. That's insane. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Now, yeah. do you, um, we, we had talked a little bit before the show, and you said that there's some special <laughs> stuff that happens on Sunday. Ah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You want to tell them a little bit about the raffle and our sponsors? I'll tell, yes. Yeah, yeah, we have, we have uh, sponsors, like all the major reed companies and saxophone accessory companies are so awesome and kind, and they send us stuff to give away at the raffles. And so, you know, throughout the week, people earn raffle tickets, you know, and, and so, so as instructors, you know, somebody gives like awesome answer. So you got you get a raffle ticket. And, and, and so by Sunday, everybody has a bunch of raffle tickets and, and you, and, and then we, we, we do a raffle and we give away a bunch of stuff and it, you know, it gets pretty hot, you know, at the end, by the end, you know. The bigger, you know, we, wait, we we give the prizes away progressively, so it builds to a, to a peak, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's pretty awesome. Out pieces, pretty out, awesome. out pieces. Yeah, we 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 have some good Navarro's, stuff. Navarro's, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, we've given away some really awesome stuff. This sounds and, like uh, an amazing, amazing experience. I mean, you know, not just it sure is. Not just the connection, the interconnection, the community, the tribe building, the great meals, of course, yeah. the one to one. That's a good word, tribe. Yeah, it is like a tribe. Yeah, yeah. it definitely yeah. is. Yeah, it is. And you know, you and you know, Donna, we got it. Of course, we got to get you out there at some point. That would yeah. be awesome. But I, I will tell you right now, the sound of sixty plus all the instructors, which is maybe another. 10 maybe 70 saxophone players all playing at once is a sound that you've never heard it's incredible it will, it will rearrange your dna <laughs> <laughs> we have everybody play the first night everybody plays together for about for a minute sec- <laughs> 60 seconds and it's really it's a it's an amazing thing because in this in the structure it's like a, it was a converted barn a big barn that we that they converted into a a performance space it's yeah. insane you yeah. feel like you're gonna like lift off the ground mm. it's like <laughs> it's the you've got to get a picture yeah. of that that would be you know what i mean yeah a great there's oh, video of it of but it. it doesn't do it yeah, justice and it then the you cannot the record this we do a group we do a group uh song and uh was it the yeah. first year we had freddie from yeah, yeah. Like, and we did yeah, pick Fred up. Victor from Average White Band was one of the students, uh, mm-hmm. and he uh, and he organized pick up the pieces. Oh wow! He, can, oh, he conduct because that's one of those songs that, that nobody plays the form right. Mm, right. So yeah. he was cueing the form, and he had it rocking. And it just imagine like everybody playing at the same time. What a great rhythm section! Harmony just, like, and everything. It was amazing. it was amazing. And yeah. playing it right too. So that's the key. I'm and sorry. playing it the right form. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so true. That was awesome. That was pretty awesome. Was, well, this, this, but again, you cannot capture that on tape or yeah, digital right. or any any kind of. You can't do it. It's not. You cannot capture capture that. Right. You have to experience you know, it. Really, you have to experience it. it's it's only can be experienced there. You just you know we don't have the technology yet to to get that on 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 any media at all. Yeah, but you know what though? So, just just based on what you're telling me and telling the audience about this this campus retreat, it's in a way it's probably good that you can't because this is all about coming back to nature, coming one with yourself, right, and right. you got to be right. there. You got to be in it to win it. You oh. got to be there to experience. Wow. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you tell us again the the website again? And is there um oh yeah is there a deadline for people to uh to register? 
yeah, so the website is InsideOutsideRetreat.com, and you can just Google Inside Outside Retreat, and it'll come up. Cool. Um, and we are more than half full right now. Mm. Yeah, yeah, um, already. I can't believe it. Yeah, and so we are down to, you know, last year we uh, we closed, and we had, um, so we sold out each year. And last year we had a waiting list of, uh, I think seven, at least seven people who who were literally waiting for a phone call if we had the space or any cancellation. So right. uh, right. we encourage people if this sounds good, if this is you've been listening to this, and I know we've been going on and on for a while now. If you're still listening, and this is something that you resonate with, you would love to give yourself that gift to do something like this. Um, register soon um, so that you right. can save mm-hmm. your spot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, listen, guys, this is, this is, you know, what this is, reminds me of, uh, because I don't think people realize, so this is a podcast and we've kind of been on, we've been on the phone together. Um, so sometimes you're hearing some little interruptions, you know, cause we're not seeing each other on video, but it's almost right. like we're around mm-hmm. a campfire, just kind of talking yeah. about the breeze and talking about this really great experience that you it can is. be a part of, you know, and I, uh, I yeah. want to thank you guys. I know you're so busy. I want to thank you for your time, letting us know about this. You're great so resource. welcome. Yeah, this, this is fantastic. I, I'm so glad to finally meet both of you. And I look forward to uh, interviewing both of you uh, individually sometime in the future. Uh, Definitely. Be great. Yeah. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, and, it'd be fun. And I'm sure uh, Bob to Reynolds you, would love to visit with you as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, make sure you get him. Uh, he really is amazing uh, at what he brings to this camp as well. And, yeah, uh, he's an inspiration. Oh, Donna, we'll see you out there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's important. Definitely. Definitely will. We'll talk about it. Yeah. So thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, be well. You. you too. And good reads to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. You too. Uh,